Thanks for coming to the um, App Storm. Uh, it's uh, business time, as they say, demo time. So um, I'll introduce your, your MC for the evening and the guy who uh, got this all organized, um, Mr. John Whitaker. Well, thank you very much for all coming. Uh, as Owen says, uh, they, we're getting to the business end now. Uh, these teams uh, just got together for the first time on Sunday. And uh, based on the uh, Tate APIs that we've been developing to enable people to develop applications, uh, those teams have brainstormed some customer stories and have uh, all come together and in just two days implemented what you're going to see today. So I'd like to thank our partners who've come together with our Tate developers in the room from Zetron, Droidworks, Highground, Avtech and Exacom. This is our second demo. And as I say, you're looking at uh, just two days worth of work. I'm going to shut up now and I'm going to hand you over to the first team and let the games commence. So the first team is Team Drone Cubed, consisting of Randy from Zetron, Conrad from Droidworks, and Charlie from Tate. Thank you very much. Um, just like to take one moment real quick to uh, thank Tate for uh, hosting us here. They've been very generous. Um, and it's been a very nice experience, so thank you very much. Um, so when we came here, we broke into teams and we each came up with uh, various customer stories using the various technologies that we had from the members of the team. So for our team, uh, the main story was to decide what could we do with a drone, and in this case it's a very autonomous drone that can fly out, do its own things. And so instead of looking at it as a controlled device, we were looking at it more as an autonomous device that could go out and gather information to add to situational awareness. So the one we started with was a natural disaster. Um, we went with something like an earthquake where when you first roll out and you have an event like this, you have a mobile command center rolling in, and we were looking for a way to gather situational awareness quickly without having to use, say, the first responders that would normally show up, and you turn right around and send them out on reconnaissance to go see if the roads are passable, uh, where the inhabited areas were, see if you can make contact with people. And so what we were thinking was you could send the drones out to do this operation immediately when the command center showed up. They could go do the surveying for you, and you could then bring that information back and use it to actually direct the initial responders directly to where they're needed, rather than having to pull them all into a central location and re-dispatch them again. So once we came up with that concept, um, we started looking at different ways we could combine technologies that the drone has. One of the things it has on it is a camera. So what we could do is go look for, say, people in the environment or something where the disaster has occurred using various sensors and instruments. In this case, we only have a visual camera, but the idea is you could use an infrared or heat sensing or other sensors to detect things. Um. <laughs> 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 uh, if you left the drone unattended for too long, it's a little temperamental. <laughs> so you have to pay attention to it or it starts uh, making noises. It doesn't like to be ignored. Yeah. So the concept was while it was out there looking, well, there were things we could do to potentially, one of the concepts we had was, you know, if it had a radio on it, you could say do announcement broadcasts in the area to tell people what was going on, maybe where the safe locations were. Um, off of that, we came up with it would be a good idea to use the camera to say do some detection. So if somebody signaled the drone, you would be able to mark it on a map, and that's where we brought in some of the other technology to where when the drone's moving on a pattern, it could then detect, I saw an event. In this case, we're using a, a flash of light uh, to do the detection. But the idea is it could be anything uh, that the drone is programmed to look for. And once it found that, it would mark the map and say, I saw something here. And somewhere farther forward of that, you could use it to, say, do a short recording of the area or potentially even bring the drone in and have a two-way conversation. If you, say, had a microphone attached to it, then you could open up a two-way conversation. So those were some of the ideas we were moving along towards. Uh, I'd like to think we made it pretty far along there. So on that, I'll let uh, Charlie here talk a little bit more about the technology we used to uh, start solving some of these uh, problems that we saw with this scenario. 
Um, so this is, uh, it was a mashup of all our free technologies. We have the DroidWorks drone, uh, Zetron backend uh, connected with our TAT API. And it was a lot of, you know, sending of um, real-time video data back to our backend here, which did uh, real-time video processing, which then allows us to start posting all this data to the TAT API, uh, which is available to all of our technologies. And we were able to visually plot this on a map. Um, which we'll show you uh, very soon. And just to reiterate, it took us two days to do this, 12 hours. Um, so I'm quite happy with what we managed to achieve in those two days. So we'll start the demo now. So on with the demo. Yippee. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so we. Um, Fortunately, you can't fly the drone around here, so we had to simulate some co uh, the flight path that it would take. So you'd send it out there autonomously, it would follow some kind of grid. So it will, we will simulate the drone moving, and we'll be able to show you that when we flash lights, that it will, it will be able to detect the lights, and also it should be able to detect orientation. So if we start tilting this drone in different directions, it will actually be able to realize it's pointed in a di different direction and trigger uh, uh, a location. Um, in that particular direction, so. Okay, so yeah, we've got here's the map, uh, the drones up here that we'll be following. Down the lower left-hand corner, what we've got is the actual image processing. So the image you're seeing on the left is the actual raw video feed off of the camera off the drone. Uh, what's on the right there is what you see is the uh, detection uh, matrix that it's using to detect the light. So currently you can see the light source it found up in the top left corner, but currently it's not detecting anything else beyond that. So when we flash it with the light, you'll see it show up there, which should cause an event over on the map. <laughs> we were experiencing technical difficulties. Any drone questions? If we can't fly it in here, can we let's take it outside? <laughs> uh, we'll be looking at flying it a little later here. Yeah, at the end of the demos, we might be able to convince Conrad to, to show us how she fly. Okay, no pressure. I'll try. Okay, so now it's got up. It's on it. You can see it moving. Yep, there we go. So we can All right, we're in flight. So our drone is now uh, flying a search pattern. And uh, we just got our first uh, hit detect there, which occurred behind it. So you can see the flash of light there that occurred. And we've got another detect incident up there. Now if we start turning the drone, You turned it. <laughs> there you go. Hey, there we go. And there's one that's off to the side. And so the idea is uh, we've currently got a uh, camera hooked on underneath the uh, drone that as you turn it is handing in directional coordinates. And so if we can get it rotated far enough, it'll actually pick up the detection event and put it in that direction. Just want to take the phone off. Yeah. All right, we'll spin the engineer instead. <laughs> yeah, it's, oh, better shut off there. Okay. So anyway, um, this was uh, our simulation of the uh, drone flying over, detecting events, seeing things on its camera, marking up a map for someone to go back and look at later, and. Uh, 
And we basically have this working end to end with all of our technologies. So um, it's live all the way from the uh, light uh, source there in the uh, flashlight all the way through the drone, through the calculations and straight through Tate's API and onto the mapping application. So now we have to do the dispatch, right? Yes. <laughs> Though in this scenario, you're probably at some command center, so what you're really doing is establishing command and control at that point. And hopefully this allows you to have better situational awareness of what's out there. Okay, well, thank you very much. That was our demo. Great, well, well done, Team Drone Cubed. I guess uh, suffering just a couple of little bits of demo syndrome there, just to show you this is authentic and real. Yeah. Who's behind the curtain there, John? <laughs> Okay, our next team is Team NWA, um, consisting of Alex from Higher Ground and Tony from Tate. Uh, do you want to admit what NWA stands for? Well, I think we all know what it stands for. <laughs> Nerds with apps. <laughs> Test, one, good. Uh, right, so I'm Tony from Tate. And I'm Alex from Higher Ground. Uh, now today, uh, our story uh, revolves around a police officer who's pulled over a speeding vehicle. He's got out of his car to talk to the driver and the vehicle's taken off. So uh, uh, our police officer, has got back into his car. He's chasing this speeding vehicle down the road. He's on the radio, his trusty Tate radio, to dispatch, informing them of the situation uh, as it unfolds. Do you want to talk about the technology we've, we've used here? Yeah. Um, so while the chase, the pursuit is going on, the, um, the radio and the, the conversation between the radio and the dispatch console is being recorded. And the Tate radio is capable of sending coordinates back to the Tate, Tate database. And uh, through the Tate API, we were able to query the coordinates in, in almost real time and integrate that into the recording for playback later. Um. Always at the wrong time, eh? Um, so right, we'll, we'll show you the demo of what we've come up with over the last couple of days. Um, now we couldn't get an audio recording of a police officer in pursuit, uh, we weren't allowed to play that. Uh, so we replaced that with a test recording of Alex's voice. Um, you'll see when we start the demo, um, uh, as the user walks around, uh, they're going to walk around the convention centre here, uh, you'll see as the, uh, as the audio plays, the, um, the pins are updated uh, and you can see where the user is. So should we get it underway? Yeah. Um, so um, um, those red tags, they are the coordinates that we query from the uh, from Tate database through the API. And it is tagged, tagged to the recordings. So, and now you get to hear what I say when I make test calls, I guess. <laughs> Starting up the call, uh, 615 call 614. And uh, wait for 10 seconds. So, um, so that was um, that was our demo. Um, so we um, accomplished um, incident recreation by helping the user a little bit on um, visualizing the incident, where it happens and how it takes place. Um, 
Do you just want me to take it from here? I think I missed out a bit earlier that I was supposed to mention. Um, uh, this, this sort of playback is the sort of thing that would be played back to a uh, judge and jury of a court trial. Uh, in our scenario, I think I forgot to mention, uh, the, the pursuit ended in an accident and someone got injured, which resulted in a court, court trial. Um, now, the existing technology, uh, the, the re audio recording, the voice recording, would be played as evidence in that court trial. Well, now, with this technology, the GPS data can be played back in this fashion um, to, to help the, the jury and judge uh, get more uh, spatial awareness of what's happening as that situation unfolds. Should we leave it there? Uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Questions or observations for Team NWA? Cool. Kelly, are you ready to go? Yes. So uh, Kelly hasn't uh, gotten round to naming his team, but seeing as his team consists of Kelly, I'm going to name it Team Lone Ranger. <laughs> Sounds good to me. Okay. Two days ago when I got here, I got talking to somebody and they uh, told me of a problem. It's quite a common problem that I found out over the last few days. And given that it's a com common problem, it is actually quite a complex problem. Simple problems are normally solved pretty easily. But as far as I was aware, there is not too many solutions out there that's going to solve this problem. The problem domain I'm talking about is uh, fire station. Fire station chief operator, he needs to know who is in his building at any given time and he needs to know what equipment he has in the building. It sounds pretty simple, but apparently it's not. Especially during shift changes. If you get some of your firefighters leaving, you get some more arriving, you then get a call that you've got to go out, dispatch a unit to a fire. Who do you know that's around there that can, uh, can do that? So we got thinking about this and the ideal solution is to have a fully automated process where any firefighter that enters a building or leaves a building, any equipment that leaves the building or comes back into the building is automatically identified and registered and updated. So uh, we got thinking about this and one potential solution is to use RFID tags to do this. Now I was talking to a few guys over the last couple of days and there's a lot of pros and cons to that sort of technology but uh, I still believe it's doable. Uh, so what the idea would be, all equipment and the whole station would be tagged. The people there will be assigned individual equipment. Firefighters normally have individual uh, face masks, protective clothing, sometimes even assigned individual radios. So if you've got that information tagged, then you can identify which people are there and which people are not. So the idea is everything's tagged, all your exits and entrances, you'd have these RFID scanners, so anything that passed through automatically gets detected, gets logged to a database. We then run an app and it pulls information out of the database and displays it nice and clearly to the uh, chief fire officer there. So that's the idea behind it. I did a, a mock-up, I spent two days scrambling around, writing lots of code, and this is what I come up with. So if you look up here on the left, it's a list of uh, personnel in the building. On the right, it's a whole list of equipment that's there. Uh, as you can see, you have different categories of present, deployed, damaged, missing, whatever you like. Now, uh, I'll give you a quick rundown on how this would work. You have to use your imaginations uh, because, oh, Tony, do you want to, do you want to grab a scanner? Okay, this red book here, you need to pretend this is a big red fire engine. 
And inside this fire engine is full of people and full of equipment. Let's say this is the, uh, the entrance to the, the building. A fire's been uh, reported. We're going to drive out the building. As we drive out, the RF tag is going to scan it. That didn't sound like a good beat. Okay, did it change? And then it went back. Okay, that's because we drove back in. So if we, if we drive back out again, and it beeps, you'll see it, uh, you'll see it up there on the screen there. So you'll see uh, a few people got deployed out. You'll see some of their equipment got deployed. And if I can magically switch screens here somehow, I think there's a magic button down here somewhere. That's off the screen and I can't see it. No, that's too low down. No, I can't find the button. Okay, so there's another screen there and it will list the rigs that are out currently deployed and it'll list on there these people that got deployed to the rig and the uh, equipment that was on the rig as well. And when you drive back in, as we demonstrated quickly before, you log back in and you'll find your people are back in the station, your equipment's back in the station. Ideally, that's the, that's the, that's the solution that you want. Completely automated, no manual processing, and people would have to log in and log out and, and manually keep track of equipment and so forth. So uh, that's what I've been doing the last few days. It's a good idea, but it needs a lot of work. Uh, I'm sure it's going to benefit some, some people sometime. Thank you, Team Lone Ranger. Any questions for Team Lone Ranger? When's it going to be finished, Kelly? <laughs> <laughs> Give me some, uh, some money and some, uh, some people. Okay, so uh, our last team, consisting of James from Tate, Tony from Avtech, and Mark from Exacom, otherwise known as Team Awesome. Can everybody see all right in here? There's, there was some people out the door before. Come on, guys. <laughs> you can just crouch down over there. So I'd just like to start by introducing our team. Uh, we've got Tony standing over in the corner. Tony, can you just tell us what you're wearing? I'm wearing a bio-harness. We're tracking all of my biometrics, my breathing, my heart rate, my current posture, and see how bad out of shape I am. Yeah, that's what we're going to do. Man, that's pretty cutting edge, Tony. Biometrics, just, just there, eh? That's amazing. And Mark, can you just tell us a little bit about the, the location information coming off that radio there? The, uh, basically the radio system is giving you GPS coordinates for uh, everything. It's also connected via Bluetooth to the, uh, the bioharness and they're providing it back over the API that we're going to use. Man, that's pretty awesome. But man, that is a lot of data coming over the network. And if you're a dispatcher, imagine having to interpret all of that information. Well, we, our idea was, oh, actually, hang on, I've just, oh, someone's talking on my ear. Right now, it's, Tom, Mark, there's, there's a situation going down at Disneyland. Uh, we better just get onto it. Uh, can you just bring up the new console application just so we can see what's happening? Wow, look at that. That looks like the Tower of Terror. And uh, with this new awesome graphical representation, we can see that we've got four operatives just positioned strategically around at the corners. Well, do we have any information on the biometrics from those officers at the moment, Mark? Oh, look at that. <laughs> so that is live information coming from Tony, everybody. Hey, Tony, how are you doing over there? Well, I'm not feeling too good. My, uh, my grandmother would say I'm probably feeling kind of puny. So... <laughs> Tony, you're uh, you're breathing out pretty hard. You're uh, still okay? Oh, no, no, oh. Tony's down. <laughs> <laughs> hey, James, can you go check on Tony? 
Yeah, I can hear that. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> Note the seamless integration of just <laughs> clicking at the icon and talking directly to the person. And, and, and see how Mark could just pick me because I'm the closest person to Tony. I'll just message him back. Hold on. Hold the phone, everybody. Uh, Mark, this is James. I'm out here. I'm just heading over to Tony's location now. Stand by. Moving, everybody. I'm moving, see? <laughs> Uh, Tony, how are you going? Are you doing all right? Much better, thank you. Okay, I'll help you up. Ugh. Awesome work, Tony. High five. <laughs> Sweet. So uh, this is the application we've been working on for the last uh, two days. So just to point out the features again, it's a console that integrates all the biometric data that's coming in over the radio network. We also are pulling in all the location data so that the dispatcher can make informed decisions with contextual information so they can keep an eye on real-time health of the people in the field as well as their positions. And that's Team Awesome. Any questions? Team Awesome, that was um, awesome. <laughs> so uh, once again, I'd just like to thank uh, all of the developers in the room from both Tate and from our partners. I think this is uh, quite a good demonstration on just how rapidly uh, we can put things together and uh, show what a bit of collaboration, creativity and innovation can do in a very short period of time uh, to actually hopefully make a difference for public safety. So uh, I guess let's just check, is there anyone in the room who would like to see the drone fly? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I guess we'd better do that, Conrad, otherwise we're going to have trouble. Okay, stand back everyone. So yeah, unfortunately there's not a lot I can do. Usually these things can fly themselves, you can fly with GPS, you can do GPS all in here. Basically just kind of hover it and try and <coughs> do some basic movements and hopefully it stays there. Can you send it over to get you a beer? <laughs> <laughs> fantastic so um, as everyone entered the room I think I got most people you got a voting brain I promised to explain that to you uh, now safety tip do not throw these brains at the teams uh, however if you could please uh, uh, think about the team whose demonstration you've uh, enjoyed the most whose demonstration has been maybe the most compelling for you uh, could you please take the time to hand one of those brains to that team and what that will do is give that team bragging rights when they get back to their office <laughs> okay so I'm just gonna hand over to Ian now for a few uh, closing remarks okay thanks John and uh, thanks for that uh, fabulous flying demonstration Kunrad. it's been uh, the highlight of uh, the event so I just wanted to close by thanking you all for coming and uh, hoping that you'll stay 
um, after this is uh, all, all done in terms of the formal part and have a drink and chat with the developers and chat among yourselves in terms of what, it, what can be done as we really start to bring applications into the public safety domain and, and uh, in, make it easier and faster to integrate uh, network capabilities with applications. So um, this is just the beginning. We've been uh, wanting to do this really as a way of showing just what's possible and we're going to go back from here and start to uh, move to production with some of these uh, APIs and start to get these in the hands of our developer partners um, and our clients who can, who can use them to integrate their systems with, with our networks and with uh, other networks. Uh, this is an open approach. Um, we're looking at this as being about making it easy to unify networks into applications um, for uh, public safety and, of course, also for utilities, uh, which is the other market we serve. So uh, I'll stop there um, with uh, just to ask you to give a round of applause to everybody who spent two and a half days here in this lovely room uh, programming away for you uh, to demonstrate. Okay, please enjoy uh, a drink and uh, enjoy the conversation. Thank you very much.